Welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, this is, my name is Kyle Estes. This is my first time at, uh, at one of these meetups. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, I work with Frank and Joe at Polaris and um, did a talk on code signing uh, just to brief our team of developers on, uh, yeah, on code signing. And Frank saw that and said, hey, this would be a good presentation kind of as is for, uh, for the meetup. So that's kind of what you're gonna see tonight. Um, my background is uh, I'm a software engineer of about 12 years in the industry. Um, graduated from the University of Minnesota with a degree in computer engineering, um, which is, for any of you who may be familiar, uh, hardware centric, um, more, more so than the software, I would say. Um, ended up getting a job with a small company as an intern in college uh, out of St. Paul <coughs> uh, called Primordial. Uh, I was the first employee hired by that company and stayed with it until October 2013 when Polaris acquired our company. So I've been working with Polaris ever since. So, um, so that's kind of been my story. Uh, Primordial, we were a C-sharp development team um, building a software development kit for point-to-point off-road route generation. And uh, so I'm real familiar with just the .NET framework, C-sharp. Um, come a long way since those days. Uh, I came out of school, got hired, and didn't know what version control was. I uh, was scared to change things on, you know, hit control S to save because I was scared I was going to mess up the repository. Uh, so coming from that as a beginning to kind of where I am now with just understanding stuff like this, um, kind of a fun journey. So that's kind of a little bit of background on me. Um, we'll go ahead and dive in here. Um, kind of a loud environment, so if you guys need me to speak up even more, it sounds like I'm okay for now. Um, just let me know. So we were uh, at Polaris. We have a mobile app um, cross-platform that we build in Xamarin, and it's got like five different flavors, so to speak. Um, Polaris sells snowmobiles, ATVs, uh, electric vehicles, and motorcycles. So we had an app for each of those. There's like five different types of apps. So uh, not to mention iOS and Android, five different flavors of each. There's kind of a proliferation of apps. and. Um, and you know, we'd kind of just been skirting by, I feel like, on this whole issue of um, when, you, when you go to upload your app to the App Store um, or Google Play and uh, you have to do this thing called code signing and these certificates come into play and even things like provisioning profiles. Um, it was kind of one of those things where it's a hassle um, to overcome the problem. Uh, so the error that I get, uh, if you look here, Maybe some of you people have seen this error. Um, it says, you need to request a code signing certificate from developer.apple.com. Um, that, that was just the, the tipping point for us. Is we've seen that error so many times, and it was time to actually understand what it meant and figure out how to, do, how to solve the problem instead of just trying to do whatever it took to fix the error. And so, uh, so I put together a, a deck of slides that you're going to see tonight that was meant for the team to just kind of help walk them through what this is. And so hopefully you'll come away from this tonight with um, a, an under, a true understanding of what code signing is, why it's necessary. Um, and, uh, and so I'm gonna try to peel it back layer by layer. Um, this is kind of the way my brain works. Hopefully it, it makes sense for you as well. Um, code signing is the process of applying a digital signature to software so that the end user can have confidence that the software is authentic and integral, right? So authentic, authenticity means the software is, um, is made by who you think it's made by. And then integrity refers to that the software hasn't been modified um, during transport at all. So you're getting what you think you're getting and you're getting it from whom you think you're getting it. Um, those two things are what uh, code signing does for you. you know, obviously those are important things when you start talking about apps going up to the store, come down to your phone, there's a lot of network traffic there. Who knows, I mean, who knows where that stuff is coming from, but it's good that they put this system in place. So um, so if you want to understand code signing, uh, in my opinion, you've got to understand uh, something called a certificate. To understand that, you've got to 
understand something called a digital signature. As we peel back, it goes to public key cryptography and then arbitrated protocols. So this presentation is going to go from the bottom up here. We're going to, we're going to talk about arbitrated protocols, then public key cryptography, then digital signatures, then certificates, and then code signing. And hopefully as we build up the layers, um, everything will make sense. I've tried to put it into really just layman's terms because um, that's kind of the way I think about things. So, um, so that's kind of the goal. If anybody has any questions, comments, jump in. We can have an open discussion as we go and see how far we get. Um, so there's a caveat here. Um, I'm not an expert on security, cryptography. Um, I would, uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm showing you, um, at least in the very first part of this presentation, comes from Bruce Schneier's book, Applied Cryptography. Um, I heard you guys talking about Bruce before, so it's good to hear that people know about him. And um, yeah, this book is awesome, really good read. And uh, there's a copy of this book actually uh, that Bruce posted on his blog. Uh, so if you want to get it, you can go on and, and look at that link. I've got a link here in the, the slides as well. Um, I would I would not call myself an expert on security or cryptography, but I would call myself an expert uh, Google searcher and Wikipedia reader. Um, I mean, that's just you know a lot of times that's what you're doing as a software engineer, right? You don't know how to do something, you Google it and you figure it out. And those of us who are successful can do that more efficiently than the rest of everyone else. So, um, kind of one thing that I kind of find charming about when you start talking about cryptography and everything is there's always this cast of characters that. Um, that the text introduces for you know playing things out like protocols and who's sending a message to who and whatnot. So I, I'm just going to follow suit with that. Um, Alice and Bob are usually the first two players. Um, a, B, right? A, it goes A, B, C, D, and it goes all the way down the alphabet. So they got to roll for every letter in the alphabet. Um, our, we're only going to use Alice, Bob, and Trent for the most part. Um, but I, I included a couple other ones in here because I thought they were funny. There's a guy named Chuck who is usually of malicious intent. Uh, Eve, an eavesdropper, she's passive. Uh, but Mallory is a, a malicious, active man in the middle attacker. And you have Trent, a trusted arbitrator or a neutral third party. Okay, so, um, so we're going to start talking about arbitrary protocols, okay? And when I started looking at this, I'm like, what does that even mean? I don't even know. But once you get through it, it makes complete sense. So let's pretend that Alice is selling a car to Bob, who's a stranger, right? She doesn't know him, doesn't trust him, has no reason to think that he's going to pay her for the car, that the check he writes is going to be good. Um, so Bob wants to write her a check, but Alice has no way of knowing if the check's good. And she doesn't want to turn the title over to him until she gets that money, right? Um, and Bob, who doesn't trust Alice any more than she trusts him, doesn't want to hand over a check without getting the title first. Okay, so we're sort of at an impasse here, right? Can anybody think about, I've got these little think things in here. Um, if you guys want to play along, that'd be great. Uh, somebody tell me, how can we move forward if neither of them trust each other? Trust Mr. T. Mr. T, yeah. Yes, yes sir. So enter Trent, a third party uh, trusted by both Alice and Bob. Um, in this case, for this car sale, Trent could be a lawyer or a banker, uh, a banker who issues a cashier's check or a lawyer who holds the title until the check clears, that type of thing. And so you're, you're sort of having this bank shot off this trusted third party. Um, and it turns out that I found as I've researched all this stuff that this whole third party uh, root of trust is like a really key concept and a very common design pattern um, that sits beneath all this stuff. So you'll see it kind of come up throughout the rest of the talk. Um, so talking about public key cryptography, okay? So let's say Alice wants to send a message to Bob, but she doesn't want anybody else to read it. So you might think of using what's called a symmetric key crypto system. Um, and just to introduce that a little bit, um, that involves Alice and Bob agreeing on some secret key that they can use for encrypting a message and then also decrypting a message. So the same key is used for both encrypting and decrypting. And that's why it's called symmetric. Um, so if Bob wants to, Alice sends the message, she encrypts it with that secret key, 
Alice decrypts the message with that same secret key, but then you might wonder, well, how do they arrive at that secret key or agree on a secret key in the first place, right? And uh, I don't know, maybe they meet up and exchange a piece of paper or something, or maybe they you know, send, a, send via email, right? But uh, what if that email isn't secure? You know, are you really gonna send a, a secret key that's supposed to be between you, Alice and Bob, over the wire? Um, because if somebody gets a hold of that, like Mallory, or uh, what's the Eve, other one? Eve, yeah, Eve, Chuck, any, any of those malicious guys, uh, you know, they can read your communications. So how do we get past that, right? Um, you can think of symmetric key cryptography as a safe, okay? So the key is the combination of the safe. I can have the key, you can have the key, anybody who's got the key can open that safe, put something in it, or extract something out of it, okay? So the key is really the part that, you know, that makes that happen. Um, can somebody tell me, does this scale? And if so, why or why not? There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, I, this this doesn't scale, right? It's uh, and if if it's not obvious, think about if you wanted to have secure communications with everybody that you talk to. Okay, you're going to have to establish that secret key. If I want to talk to you, you and I got to have a secret key. If I want to talk to you, you and I got to have a secret key. And that, it would be wise if that key was different between me and you and me and you, right? Because I don't want you to read my messages between him and vice versa. And it goes for every pair. So you end up with this really dense, highly connected communication network that is just impractical. I don't want to keep track of millions of keys. I, I, there's no reason for me to do that. Um, and so it's not really scalable. Um, Instead, consider a public key crypto system, which is also known as an asymmetric crypto system. Um, and in this type of system, uh, instead of sharing a single secret key, um, each person in the communication network has a pair of keys or a key pair. One of those keys is kept secret uh, and the other key is published for the world to see, okay? Think of it as, um, I don't know, think of it as a, everybody can know your address, but not everybody can have the keys to your house type thing. Um, there, are, there are certain things you're willing to publish about your life, and so your public key is one of them. That lets people talk to you. So the way it works is that Alice would encrypt, if she wants to send something to Bob, she gets Bob's public key and encrypts the message using Bob's public key. And then Bob would decrypt that message using his own private key. So that's the way it works. There's a mathematical um, reason that works. I looked at it, and I, I don't know enough of that discrete math and all that stuff um, to talk to you guys about. It's probably not even worth it anyway, but uh, suffice it to say that you put something into that system with the public key, you can get it out only with the private key and only with that key. And furthermore, it's infeasible to, um, to derive the private key from the public key. So you can sit there and look at Bob's public key all day long, and it's very, very, very unlikely that you will ever guess or compute his private key. So from that perspective, it's safe, it's secure, um, and heaven forbid, uh, God help us if, if that system ever fails, because uh, everything's built on it right now. Um, so Bob's public key is known to Alice and everyone else, um, maybe be, via a publicly accessible database, right? Think about, okay, everybody's got a public key, but how do I find out what your public key is to send you a message? Right, kind of almost uh, almost a similar problem to this whole symmetric key thing. Like, how do we agree upon a secret key? How do I find out what your public key is? Um, and that turns out to be a key piece of this whole thing as we go forward, which is how do I know if I want to send you a message? What's your public key? Um, and if you send that to me, how do I know that's your real public key and not his public key? Because if I encrypt something, I'm giving you all the answers up front. If I encrypt something with your public with your public key right, and send it to you thinking it's for you, the only person that can decrypt it is him. So if I get tricked somehow into thinking that somebody else's public key belongs to somebody else, uh, that's bad news, right? So there has to be some way for me to trust a public key. 
We'll get to that more later. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's not feasible for anyone besides Bob to decrypt Alice's message. So back to the whole safe analogy, think of a public key crypto system as a padlock in a box, okay? So I, if I write my message to you, put it in a box and lock it with your padlock, then so you, like for example, maybe, maybe if I want to send a message to you, you've got like pallets and pallets of these little lock boxes, each with a, you know, they're the same lock and you hold the one key in your pocket, okay? So anybody can come up to your house, grab one of these lock boxes, write a little message, put it in the box, close the lock, and who's the only person that's gonna be able to read it? It's you, right? I can't read it, nobody else can read it, even though I'm the one who wrote it and stuck it in there, I can, I can no longer decrypt that message. So that's kind of the way public key cryptography works. Uh, the cool thing about it is that, um, the cool thing about it is that it works the other way too. Um, so if you actually encrypt something with the private key, the only thing that can decrypt it is the public key. And that actually turns out to be really useful counterintuitively later on when you start talking about digital signatures. So somebody tell me, um, and I kind of already spilled the beans here, why might you need Trent for a public key crypto system? That's right. Yep. You, need, you need somebody, a trusted third party, maybe running a database or something that says, all right, I want to talk to you, here's his public key, and I have a reason to trust that because I trust bankers and lawyers, which I don't, maybe, some, maybe somebody can tell me, as we get to the end of this thing, I don't know why I should, there's this whole chain of trust, so I don't understand the whole system, but it gets to a point where I'm like, why should I trust this root certificate, or why should I trust this company? Uh, I still don't get that. Um, so yeah, not, still not uh, fully up to speed on everything here, but, um, like I said, even better, it works in reverse. So let's say I generate my own public-private key pair and I encrypt message M with the public key. How can I decrypt it? With the private key. And vice versa, if I encrypt message M with the private key, how can I decrypt it? With the public key. Um, and so it's, it's an asymmetric system, but uh, I don't know, I, when I noticed that property of it, I kind of thought, well, it's almost more symmetric than then the symmetric system itself uh, kind of has that irony to it. Um, and it's absolutely essential, that part of it uh, is absolutely essential to everything else working down the line. Okay, so we've gone through um, arbitrated protocols, okay, where you need trusted third party to resolve some kind of trust issue. Uh, public key cryptography, where there exist these pairs of public-private key pairs that allow us to communicate uh, at scale, securely, okay? Now we're entering the realm of digital signatures, which is the next rung in the ladder towards getting to code signing, okay? Um, cryptography obviously provides message confidentiality, right? Secrecy. Um, but what about authenticity? What about uh, if, if Steve sends me a message, it can be, can be gibberish, it can be confidential all day long, how do I know it's really from him, right? Um, how do, does cryptography provide that? Can we use something in public key cryptography to get at that problem of authenticity? Um, also, what about integrity, right? Um, fine, it's, it's confidential. I'm pretty sure it's from Steve originally, but how do I know that, um, that Joe didn't modify it, as a, or Mallory, I should say, um, as a as a malicious attacker in the middle, right? How do I know that the message hasn't been changed? And it turns out that digital signatures provide both of these properties, authenticity and integrity. And also a third one called non-repudiation, which doesn't really come into play for, um, for code signing. But um, the way I understand non-repudiation is that um, you can't, if you send a message, you can't ever really claim that you didn't send it. So you can't like, um, fake it. It's like irrefutable that you sent that message. Um, and so, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Should be. Yeah. If you do it right. Yep, exactly. So, um, you know, obviously message authenticity and integrity are important for end users of our mobile applications. 
Um, they need to trust that the applications they download and install are actually from the developers they think they're from. Imagine if somebody got a hold of Google's you know, account info and started publishing malicious apps as Google. Uh, wreck things. Um, or maybe you don't need a Google's account info. Maybe it's sufficient to just intercept that APK as it's coming down the wire to the phone and change a couple bits, right? Um, we need to prevent against that too. So authenticity and integrity. And funny enough, it turns out that we can use public key cryptography to implement digital signatures which provide authenticity and integrity. Here's the way it works. So you start off by generating a public-private key pair, right? Uh, and th this is something you can do, um, I mean, you can do it in, you, know, you fire up a bash prompt or on Windows, if you have Java installed, you can use key tool to do it. Um, you can open up the keychain access on a Mac and generate a certificate signing request. That'll generate a public key pair, or, uh, a key pair for you. Um, so there are a bunch of ways to do it. Um, yep, yep. Uh, first step is to get such a key pair, right? You keep that secret part of it um, secret. Keep it on your computer. Don't give it to anybody. Uh, and then the public part of it, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, has anybody ever set up like SSH access for Bitbucket or GitHub at all, right? So you need to generate a, a key pair. And which portion do you give GitHub or Bitbucket? The public part, right? It took me a long time to understand that. Like, which which part do I give? The private or the public? Do they do they need my private key? And it's like, no, no, don't give that out. It's never it's not for anybody but you. Um, so you give that public public part out. The second step is to generate a signature. Uh, and so like in the most layman simple form, uh, a signature, if I'm sending a message to somebody, my signature could just be the, the words Kyle Estes, um, printed down at the end of the message, right? And then the next step is to encrypt that text, the signature, Kyle Estes, with my private key, okay? Uh, and that is the essence of a digital signature, okay? Nobody else can, well, actually everybody can decrypt that using my public key. So that's step, well, step four is to attach the digital signature to the message you're gonna send. So, hey, here's the message, encrypt it, whatever, and then append to it this, um, this um, cryptified, what's the word I'm looking for? Cryptified? Encrypted, god damn it, I'm a noob at this. Uh, <laughs> uh, encrypted string, uh, just append it to the message. That, so that goes along with the message, right? And, um, and then step five, the recipient gets the message and they try decrypting the digital signature piece with my public key, okay? And they know what to expect at the end of that process when they decrypt that signature. It's my signature, it should be my name, right? Um, and so if they decrypt it and they see anything but Kyle Estes, then they'll know that something's wrong. Either it got hacked during transport or the person who signed this isn't really Kyle Estes or whatever the case may be. Something's wrong, they can't trust that message. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how a digital signature in essence works. So technically, how do you know what a digital signature is supposed to be? Say again? Technically, how do we know what a digital signature is supposed to be? Yeah, I'll get to that later. The yep, the, that comes up um, in code signing. The way that actually ends up working is uh, with hash functions. So the, the key piece is that when something is signed and co a code signed, uh, you actually are hashing it, and that hash is what gets sent over the wire, okay? And then when the APK comes down, the user can generate that same hash and compare. So that, that comparison of um, what's been sent to what I can generate is kind of where you expect those two to match. So that's probably a bad way of explaining it. Maybe it'll become clearer later. But. Okay. Um, are we done? How can Chuck or Mallory mess things up here? Right, exactly right. So back to the whole thing of, okay, I can fake it, right? I can use, I can claim that I'm somebody else, use my own key pair, everything works out. So to elaborate on that, how can Bob trust that a given public key actually belongs to Alice? Why does it matter? What if Chuck impersonated Alice 
if Chuck can trick Bob into thinking that Chuck's, this is, this is all wordy, that Chuck's public key is actually Alice's, then Chuck may be able to read messages from Bob meant only for Alice. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's, that, that's what we have to guard against, right? Is we have to find a way around that. So we're, we're, we're setting up all these things, you know, arbitrated protocols, trusted third parties, public, private keys, digital signatures. It's looking good, but no, we have to keep going, keep going until we've got everything and all the problems licked, okay? So now, on to certificates. It's only 720. Um, kind of flying through this. You guys, feel free to jump in if you have any comments or questions. Um, heck, some of you guys might know more about this than I do, so jump in if I'm missing anything. Um, and sorry for the small text, too. Uh, I did this in Sway. Has anybody used Sway before? It's like Microsoft tool that, I don't know, kind of like PowerPoint online version of it. And yeah, it doesn't really allow you to adjust the text size, so apologize for that. Um, so on to certificates here. So a certificate is basically a set of data that identifies an entity or an entity where an entity is a person or an organization. So it's got, you know, all the things you would expect for identifying someone. Their name, their contact information, their address, their email, their phone number, all that stuff. That's, that forms part of a certificate. Um, what's that? Yeah, common name, organizational unit. Um, there's a bunch of fields in there. I'm not sure what to put in each one of them when I, when I fill them out sometimes. Yep, yep. And then also the other key piece is the public key, right? So a certificate is just a document that says, my name's Kyle, here's my email address, my phone number, here's where I live, and here's my public key, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Frank. I was reading about this on GoDaddy's website the other day. They have some good documentation. You don't really think about GoDaddy as being a place to go for super technical stuff, at least I don't. But, um, of course, they deal with SSL certs all day long. And, uh, yeah, they say the same thing. You know, if you want to get a certificate, um, you, need to, you need to be a company. You can't be an individual. And you need to provide one of these documents. And there's articles of incorporation is one of them. Or, bunch of other formal things and they and they vet it. You know, they do not say what you just said to me. You just said international name is not Oh okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting. So certificates have the entity info and the public key. Um, and the goal is to persuade others that Yes, this entity owns this public key for real. Um, and so are we done? Just because I hand you a certificate that maybe has a nice cute little blue badge on it and it's got a bunch of frilly designs on it, right? It's a certificate. I should accept it. Um, does that mean we should automatically trust her? Are we done? Right. Right. Exactly. So we need to create certificates that have the power to persuade everyone of their legitimacy. And um, the answer is getting a, yet again, getting a trusted third party to put their rubber stamp on that signature so that when you hand me your certificate, I say, oh, well, I'm not sure about you, but this person I trust says they trust you. And and, for the, and that chain of trust actually is a pretty important thing because I might not trust that entity that trusts you, but there's another entity that trusts them, and there's another entity that trusts them, and I trust that entity all the way over here, and I can follow that chain of trust down 
to eventually do something useful with you. Um, and so that's kind of how these certificates work. Um, yeah, so chain of trust, right? Established by validating each component of hardware and software from the bottom up. So I, I found this interesting part of a Wikipedia article here. Most of this is just kind of extracted from that article, but it kind of helped me understand how things work from this whole chain of trust standpoint. Think about a computer booting up, um, you know, the very first thing that it does, uh, loads some boot code, right? And that hardware will only boot from software that is digitally signed. That boot software will only run other software that is digitally signed, and so on. So that process results in this chain of trust. Um, the final software can be trusted because if it had been illegally modified, its signature wouldn't be invalid and the previous software would not have executed, right? So at no point will, in this system, will we ever load up and execute um, things that aren't authentic or things that aren't integral, okay? Um, and then down the line, the previous software can be trusted because it would have not loaded and the previous software and the previous software, so you just follow that all the way back to that root layer. In the case of a computer booting, I guess it's going to be the, the hard-baked code in the EEPROM that loads the software or something. There's going to be some keys in there, some hardware baked in keys. I, have to, I guess I have to trust that, those, that that's legit. So how can you establish that the software has to load in illegal software? You know, so the EEPROM says, hey, I trust this, I'm going to load this, I trust this, I'm going to load this. How can you make sure that somewhere along the line there's a software that you're intentionally or unintentionally like a root kit, maybe? Something like that? I'm not sure. The second one would be a lot more lucrative. No. What is that? So, I will give you my very long explanation of it. Okay. I heard about them. Yeah, well, I've been avoiding buying yeah, Lenovo's yeah. for that reason. <laughs>
That's good, good stuff. Um, so yeah, there's, there's this um, trust chain, and then at the, at the root of that is something called a trust anchor, uh, which is an authoritative entity for which trust is assumed and not derived. Um, yeah, and back to that point about the Chinese laptops, you know, um, we, sh we were trusting that. Uh, that was kind of the root of the trust chain, in my opinion, and that whole thing, and look where it got you, right? I'm not sure why, why why we trust certain things, um, why those things get to be designated as the, the chain, or the, the anchor of trust, but uh, it's interesting. When the SSL first started, there was only a license to be able to write it. For free, maybe. And then as time has gone by, You just don't know. Yeah, it's like I don't, I don't trust. Nobody asked me if I trust that. You know, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Joe, we were just looking at Joe's laptop too, and I, on my Android phone, there's companies in China, and I'm just like, eh, it's kind of dicey. So. Uh, on a somewhat related note, has everybody seen how uh, Google and Facebook are going to have like verified or trusted search results now too? Like, how are they going to determine what is actually a verified or an authentic or fake? Yeah, fake news. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so root certificates for the trust for the trust anchor for the whole chain of trust. What does that mean? Most operating systems use a collection of X509 certificates. Uh, X509 is just a standard. Um, and so there's a collection of certificate of, uh, authorities that come pre-installed with the operating system or with your browser. Um, and users are ultimately trusting the organizations who provide that list of root certificates. Um, so you can check this out for yourself. Um, you can go to a website that uses TLS, like Google, Wells Fargo, US Bank. Uh, click the little lock icon in the address bar. Uh, and you can see the certificate path. So if we go, say we go to google.com. So HTTPS, so we're at TLS encrypted. Click the lock icon. Connection is private. Go to the details. View certificate. And so you can see here that we have this certificate, then this one, and then this one. So it's, it always seems like it's a chain of three. Um, I'm not sure if that's like standardized or 
I was expecting to find some websites that have longer chains, um, but every one I go to seems like it just has those three. Um, and so you can look at this certificate, like look at its details, for example, and you can see things in here like One second. Okay, so public key, public key parameters. If we were to click public key here, we could scroll down and we could actually see the public key and there's hashes in there and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so you know you can sort of see that chain in action there just right in your web browser. So there's something called a public key infrastructure that um, is meant to store these certificates and build a level of trust as we distribute them for people who need to communicate. So it's a centralized trust model um, and it consists of this yeah, strict hierarchical system of certificate authorities. I trust this, this trust that, and so on and so forth. Standardized as X.509. There's an alternative to that called Web of Trust which uh, I was just reading up on recently preparing for this presentation, um, where it's a decentralized trust model. Um, accomplishes the same thing, where the goal is to, you know, build up a collection of trusted certificates, um, but it's decentralized. Uh, and it involves things like vetting and voting schemes. Um, the idea is that, as I understand it, as I read up on it a little bit, is that each of us would have this sort of collection of trusted certificates, right? So if, let's say I meet you face to face and I get your public key from you and I can see it's you and I check your ID and I have every reason to believe that that's legit, right? So now I, I have this, uh, a collection of length one of trusted certificates. And um, if anybody else wants to communicate with you, there's this <clears throat> network where they can see which ones I trust and if they trust me, then they can trust that. And, and so they, it kind of builds up this whole network thing. And uh, yeah, there's like things like key signing parties where people actually physically get together um, and have a party and look at each other's keys and you know, sign them and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I just found it funny, I mean, you see people handing back SHA-1 fingerprints of your public key, and I'm like, man, that's so freaking nerdy. We should, we should totally do that. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Key signing party. We'll do it at the December party. Generate a key pair and bring your public key. Don't bring your private key. <laughs> Is there really? <laughs> oh, I got I gotta see that. Hang on a second. X K C D. There's also levels of trust too, right? Mm. With that, uh, level of trust. Yeah. Is there okay? I didn't read about it too deeply, but is this one here? Yeah. Ah. Where'd my mouse go? Okay. Hey, I just got home from the party. The one with the IRC folks? Yeah. How was it? Got too drunk. I screwed up bad. What happened? There was a girl. No idea who she was. Don't even know her name. I was too drunk to care. <laughs> and what? You slept with her? No. I signed her public key. <laughs> That's awesome. I like that. Golden as usual. Okay. So, Web of Trust. Yeah, so certificates. You, it turns out that we use digital signatures to, uh, to associate public keys with their owners. Um, the public key, its owner, and the digital signature of a trusted third party um, form the certificate. Um, and so, yeah, that certificate and your digital signature on your code is what makes up code signing. So with all that, I think we're finally ready to talk about code signing. This diagram here is worth 
studying in detail. So let's go through it. This data, you can think, I think of that as the source code or the whatever gets compiled when you, you know, control B in Visual Studio or whatever, you know, it's the, it's the code. Um, and the idea is that we hash that with a cryptographic hash function. That's step one. Step two, we encrypt that hash using the signer's private key. Okay? So far, so good. I have a public key and I have a private key. We're going to take, we're going to encrypt the source code with my private key. Okay? So now we have an encrypted hash of the source code. We also have this separate thing uh, called a certificate, which we just talked about, right? Which is my public key, all of my information, and the rubber stamp of someone that you trust as a consumer of this information, right? And so we bundle those two things up, the hashed, um, encrypted code with the certificate, and that's what forms a, um, a digitally signed document. Okay, so you can think of this thing down at the bottom here, uh, I think of that as like the APK file you get from the App Store or the IPA file you get from the App, the app Store, okay? Um, so that's how things get signed. What's that? That's my understanding, yep, yep. Yeah, and so it's more efficient than hashing the code itself, right? Because hashes shouldn't have collisions, and so encrypting the hash is just a much more efficient way to do that. And so now, the key piece is what happens with that information, right? I'm pulling down an APK file or an IPA file from the App Store, and I want to make sure this, this is good to go. The first thing I do is I find out which component is the data, and I find out which component is the digital signature, okay? Um, the digital signature is um, from the certificate, right? So I go to that digital signature, I use the signer's public key to decrypt it, right? So I'm decrypting. Decrypt, basically undoing the encryption and putting it in by their private key. Right, right. They the plain text hash of the file, then you do. Exactly right. Hash the file. That's exactly right. Yep, yep. Yep. So is that clear to everybody? I, every time I look at this, I have to kind of go through it step by step. So it's time to take a public key and hash and can be encrypted with the public key. Yep, yep. That's correct. Yep. And so I know, and the public key I'm using here is trustworthy because of the whole way certificates work. Right? Right. I can take the app, resign it, and then send it to anyone else as like my app. Mm -hmm. And which happened actually after the big company took the real app. Yeah. And then that's how they did it. They took your app, encrypted, and now signed it with their encryption. Right, right. And now this happened in the app store. And then now they're selling your app like they oh. Yeah, right. Yeah, and so an, an unwitting user might mistakenly install that fake app or that malicious app instead of the real one, yeah. right? And, and it's fine because of the security, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but their Android and iOS function differently in the way they, they care about that, right? Um, Android is a little bit more freewheeling. It's like, I don't care who you are so long as you're the same person who built the app in the first place, right? So if, if I install an APK from the App Store, um, and um, and then I'm going to go to update that APK. Let's say I'm a let's say I'm a malicious third party, and I want to go to the App Store, to the Google Play Store, let's say, and I want to upload a malicious version of I don't know Waze. Um, okay, fine. Google won't actually allow me to even upload that APK because it knows that unless I have the secret key that was used in the signing process for 
originally for the first version of Waze they ever uploaded. Um, it'll, it'll just know that I'm not the original developer. So they don't really care about who you are so long as you're consistent. You're the, you're the same guy who built the app, you're updating it and whatnot. And that has to do with the whole security model of Android. They actually use, I, I talk about this later. We can get to that in a second. So, so this is how the verification works here. Um, you compare those hashes. That's kind of, I think of these hashes here as the same, uh, the Kyle Estes text, right? You know, what, you know what to expect. You can compute what you're getting and see if they match. Okay, so obviously Google and Apple require developers to code sign their applications. Uh, involves applying a digital signature to the application. What a hassle that is. Uh, when end users download applications, the Android and iOS operating systems check the digital signature on behalf of the user. So I think it, you know this way the user just never really ever thinks about it, right? The, and that's actually a kind of a two-point check. Um, they won't let you even publish an app to the store um, unless you have it correctly code signed. But even if you even if you avoided the store, let's say you sideload an app onto your phone, right? Uh, there's the, the the installer will enforce proper code signing at that point. So whether it's um, preventing things, you know, malicious things from getting into the store or preventing them from getting out of your phone, you have to have both of those safety nets. Um, that's kind of what's happening here. Okay, when the digital signature is checked, the app developer's public key needs to be known. Where can it be found? We should all know the answer in the certificate. Um, the app developer's public key is provided by a trusted third party, in this case, Google or Apple. So Google and Apple, you can think of them as Trent in this scenario. Uh, the public key provided in the form of a certificate that comes as part of the app download from the store. Um, and I, I looked into this, wasn't able to make much progress of like how to get the certificate portion of like an APK file. I think APK files are just zip files at the end of the day. So I was thinking, ah, maybe I can go in there and figure out which, where is the cert? I want to look at a cert for a real APK and kind of see what that looks like, but wasn't able to make much progress on that. Um, certificate contains both the app developer's public key and other pertinent information. So kind of going over the same stuff here. So talking about the way Google and Android do code signing versus the way Apple and iOS do code signing. It, there's some really interesting differences there. Um, so Google and Android, this is out of order, um, developers choose to provide their own self-generated key. Okay? In this scenario, the user would normally have to obtain the public key in some fashion directly from the developer to verify the object is from them for the first time. Many code signing systems will store the public key inside the signature. Some software frameworks and OSs that check the code signature before executing will allow you to choose to trust that developer from that point on after the first run. An application developer can provide a similar system by including the public keys with the installer, which is what happens in the case of Android. The key can then be used to ensure that any subsequent objects that need to run, such as upgrades, plugins, or another application, are all verified as coming from that same developer. So that's how Android works. Like I said, it doesn't care who you are, as long as you're the same person that it came from originally. Okay? Apple and iOS uh, work differently, where the public key that is used to authenticate the code signature, um, they enforce that it be traceable back to a trusted root authority, um, preferably using a secure public key infrastructure, right? Um, and so this does not ensure that the code itself can be trusted, only that it comes from the stated source or more explicitly the person who has the private key, right? Um, and so a CA provides a root trust level and is able to assign trust to others by proxy. So if you trust the root CA, then you can presumably trust the legitimacy of code that is signed with a key generated by that CA or one of its proxies. And so it's almost like with Android, you're, yeah, you're trusting the consistency of the builds, developer to developer, right? Same developer developed this build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. And then with, with Apple, you're trusting that the root authority 
is doing its due diligence, checking on who you say you are as a developer when you request a certificate, right? So I don't know which one is better, honestly. I don't know if, if either one is better. Um, I'm sure they had... Yeah. Yeah, and these, uh, these, these certificates, they expire too. I think by default you get something, some enormous expiration date like 2035 or something like 20, 30 years in the future. And it kind of makes you wonder what's gonna happen to everything when all those certs start expiring, you know? Uh, some, what's that? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, I actually don't know. Smarter people than us have probably already figured that one out, but I, it's, Interesting to think about, nonetheless. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so just a couple of details. We're getting towards the end here. Um, how are we doing on time? Ten minutes. Good. Uh, so public-private key pairs. Just some details on how those work for Android and Google and versus iOS and Apple. Um, in Android, you use the Java built-in binaries for um, generating key pairs. Um, and so you have this thing called a key store, all right? Um, and a key store is nothing more than a, um, yeah, you can think of it as a lockbox. So it's got a a lock on the outside, and on the inside are many index cards, each of which contain, actually on the inside you can think of it more as several other lock boxes. Each inside of those is a key pair, okay? So a key store kind of has this double layer of protection where to get into the key store, you have to provide a password, and then to get any of the public, or the, the key pairs out of the key store, you have to provide a password for those as well. Okay, so there's kind of a, it would be, I don't know why they do that double layer. I suppose it's to um, allow multiple users to use the same key store. So if, if we all want to dump our keys into the same key store, um, I could protect my key with my own password. You could do the same, everybody could do the same, we could all use the same file. I don't know how realistic that is, especially for like Polaris, you know, we have one, one key in the key store, so when you do everything, you know, with the jar signer and code signing and stuff, you have to enter that the password twice and all that stuff. But, but it makes sense, right? There's a mechanism here for a, a container for key pairs, and the container's locked on the outside, and then each of the key pairs on the inside are also protected as well. So that's kind of what you're getting with a Java key store. Uh, and then iOS keeps the... Uh, keeps, well, yeah, the, the cert, their certificate is also stored there. In the case of Android, it's self-signed. Um, iOS, uh, the equivalent of a key store on iOS is your, um, your keychain, right? So if you go to um, your, your operating system, keychain access, um, that is the equivalent of your key store. And so you have many uh, key pairs in there, um, that you know serve the same function, right? So that's kind of what you're dealing with on when you're code signing something. The input to that code signing process, in the case of Android, is going to be that .jks file, um, and the input to it on the on the Mac side will be your keychain. So that's why when you sign stuff, it's always prompting you for access to your keychain. The way we do it at Polaris, I just created another. Um, you can go into keychain access and create another keychain file, right? It's just a container, so it's like file new keychain. And uh, 
and you can put the keys and the certificates that you want to use for a particular project into that keychain. Um, we keep that keychain, it's password protected, we keep it in source control, and that's kind of how we handle it. So. Mm -mm. No, we use AWS. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure AWS has something similar. We don't use that piece of AWS, but yeah. John, really quick, what did you just did with Smart App? We're storing our key keys in our backend. Can you just put those in the keychain? I'll put those in the Yes, it's exactly right. Yep. So your so that keychain would only contain a single certificate for that. That's right. And have a separate password than your system password. Mm, I can't remember what, how we set that up. Something like that. Yep. Yep. But that's exactly right. We did it for the CI build essentially. Um, I can quick walk you guys through a couple of extra decks I put together. So some of you might recognize. Um, Apple requires you to go to the certificate authority. So to generate a certificate, you actually have to request it, right? So you go to Keychain Access, and you go to um, hello. Oh, I guess this is a scroll. Okay. Oh, whoops, I'm unprepared. This is, the job, this is the Java one. Oh, we'll switch gears here, so real quick. With Java, key store, JKS file on disk, generate a new public-private key pair, put the new key pair into the key store. So you think of the Java key store as your house. Your house has a lock on the front door. Within your house, there may be one or more containers, which themselves are locked, safes, diaries, things like that. Each of those having their own keys to get in. And here's a screenshot of Android Studio here, where you can see you've got your key store path, right? The password for the key store, and then the key of interest for signing this app in Android Studio. Um, it has a name, an alias called My Android Key. It has a password, and it's valid for 25 years by default. And then here's all the information about um, the entity yourself um, that gets um, used for the certificate. And so all that information gets stored in the key store. Well, okay, so that's about all I got, guys. I mean, we're kind of just hashing over the same stuff here. Um, anybody else got any questions, comments before we wrap up here? Yeah. Yeah. So how did you actually get a certificate? Did you generate your public private key pair, hang on to your private password public to the certificate authority and say, here I am? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, I have, you're talking about the case of uh, iOS? No. Okay. Well, in iOS, it, it's a good example of the way it works. Um, in iOS, you, you actually go to the keychain assistant, Right, which is your container of keys. And you say, I want to generate a certificate signing request. Okay? And what that does on your behalf is it creates a new key pair. Okay? 
and then it saves on disk the public key, right? And your entity information, presumably. Actually, in the case of Apple, it does. I think it just saves the public key. You can have it emailed, or you can save it to disk. I always save it to disk. That's correct. Yes. So, so the so the, what happens then is, you go to the keychain assistant. You say, I want to generate a certificate signing request. It first generates a key pair for you, okay, and then you hit next, and it says, um, type down the file name to store this request file. And in that request file is your public key, okay. The next step is I go to developer.apple.com. I sign in with my uh, Polaris account credentials and I go to the certificates section and there's a section where I can upload a signing request to their servers. And, um, and they don't need to know any more than the public key in the file I give them because they already know who I am. I've already authenticated with them. And so they get that request in with the public key and they return to me a proper certificate that has my entity information, my public key, and Apple's, in this case, rubber stamp of hey, I trust this, and here's my chain of trust, and you can follow it back. So that's kind of how that works. What's that? That's correct. Yep. And so when you get that certificate back, it's a .sir file, and you can double-click that, um, and that will import it into, back into your keychain, into your store. And so now, um, now in your, in your private key, uh, store of keys, you've got that certificate, with that, that trusted public entity info certificate along with the private key that was generated in the very beginning. Right there handy. It always starts with you though. Yeah. Yep. You never leave your private, you never let go of your private That's correct. Yep, that stays on your computer the whole time. That's right. That's what you use to do your CI build as well because you would spell on the system doing the CI builds. Mm. And then Dirk Science got a couple of other kinds of servers too. One you can only sign with the right drivers with the thumb drive in the machine. Oh, okay, yeah. And there's another one where you can get a file Okay, okay. So are you are you saying that that would be a way to yeah. avoid keeping the keychain in source control? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Interesting. So on, on that system. Yeah. Right. I have not either. I don't know about that. There would, seems like there would have to be a way to, right? Because. Yeah, 
Thanks, guys. Right, yeah, so yeah. Question. Yeah. Doing that, doing that X509 handshake that I heard in the nothing is going back and forth as far as the private key. <coughs> What's going back and forth? Because there's at least five or six. At least five or five. Go ahead. The other way around, yeah. They'll do asymmetric, right? And they'll exchange public keys. And then through that encrypted uh, channel, then they'll pass, so they'll do a secret key, which is symmetric cryptography. And then from there on out, it's all symmetric. And the way that the reason they do that is asymmetric is way more expensive in computation for encrypting and decrypting. Whereas symmetric, since it's the same going both ways, So, so think about so think about you're a web browser and you walk up to you request a page from Google.com. Okay? What do you what do you see? What do you have in terms of information? You have their certificate. Right? That's all you have. You have the web page and their certificate. Um, and if you want to start encrypting traffic, all you have is that certificate. We know the certificate has their public key. So I know I can like I, what, what Steve said, what I would probably do is generate a, a symmetric key for a symmetric key cryptography system. Generate that, and then I would encrypt that using the public key on their, their certificate, knowing that that's okay, I can send that over the wire now because the only person who can decrypt that is Google.com, right? And, and how do I know I'm not being tricked into using somebody else's public key, like Packer.com? because of the whole, the, the certificate has been signed all the way up to the root authority. So that handshake is all public stuff. Um, and it, like Steve said, it, my understanding is that it's used to, um, it's used just up front to establish actually a much faster encryption, decryption technique, uh, symmetrical system. So. And as part of that handshake, there are the tough sort of protocol and negotiation where the browser and the server goes up and down to figure out What is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Franco Systems? Hacked. Port 80 is open. <laughs>
Oh, okay, okay. I didn't build it. <laughs> I wonder if we punched in SSLlabs.com if it would ca cause the internet to break or something and recursive check on itself. Yeah, be worth it. Well, thanks, thanks, guys. Appreciate the time.